welcome to Letters of Map Change. Uh, we're going to be talking about Letters of Map Amendment, Letters of Map Revision based on Phil, and Letters of Map Revision in this class. Now, when we're talking about these letters, um, we're talking about Letters of Map Change, and hardly any of us ever use the term LOMIC. You know, when, when I say, hey, you know, you, did you get a LOMIC for this? most of you don't know what I'm talking about because that's a term we don't use. It's an umbrella term, letter of map change. And what we mean by that are letters of map amendment, uh, letters of map revision, letters of map revision based on fill. And when we talk about a letter, you're not gonna get this nice narrative. What you're gonna get essentially is this form that you see on your screen right now. Uh, and it'll say letter of map amendment up at the top. But, uh, but that's the form most of you have dealt with letters of map amendment and letters of map revision, letters of map revision based on fill, but that's essentially what they look like. Uh, by the way, I'm not gonna go into much detail about conditional letters of, of each of these, but there are conditional letters of each of these, conditional letters of map amendment, conditional letters of map revision based on fill. Uh, we'll address that, but only briefly. I think if I talk to you about uh, you know, for the sake of time, uh, we're not going to go into a lot of detail, and I don't think there's a whole lot of detail to go into. If you understand letters of map revision, then I think you'll understand the conditional letters of map revision. Um, so when would we want to apply for a letter of map change? Well, it could be that there's an update uh, of the map due to better topographical data. Uh, this is a good example of why we would have a LOMA, which we're going to go into detail about. But um, most of you know that a LOMA is a letter of map amendment, and it deals with natural grade. You might have a floodplain that's a mile and a half wide, and they just sort of filled it all in blue between this border and this border. And they didn't look at every little square foot along the way, and maybe a portion of somebody's property that they want to build a house on is kind of elevated higher than the property around it. And maybe it's higher than the base flood elevation and shouldn't have been included in the map. So they hire a surveyor and they get better topographical data. They submit that to get a letter of map amendment. You could also provide better topographical data if you've got it for a letter of map revision to take a whole portion of your community out of the floodplains. There could be a physical change in the floodplain. And here I'm, I'm thinking about uh, specifically, I'm thinking about letters of map revision based in based on uh, fill. You know, uh, maybe uh, Sherry gives a, a permit for somebody to bring in some fill to elevate their property so that it's now higher than the base flood elevation because they want to build a, a combine shed or maybe even a new house uh, out in Howard County, something along that line. And so there's been a change in the floodplain, but it could also entail something like. Uh, like Wahoo with the big uh, lake that they've got north of town, or maybe even Waverly where they have that big uh, structure. And I think Waverly did that. They built that large flood containment structure. And I believe they went ahead and applied for a letter of map revision to change the floodplain in town uh, because they built this large structure. So there was a, a change within the floodplain that uh, constituted a change in the maps in that case. Or maybe even better modeling. You know, a lot of you that are way out west, you've got old maps that were done back in the 70s. And they were probably done by some college kid that just looked at the topo maps and did some sort of ran some sort of numbers. Um, and maybe you've got maps that just aren't real accurate. Uh, and since then, they've come up with better models. And remember, some of you have my class before, when we talk about models, you know, I'm not talking about like, uh, uh, model airplane or something along that line. When we say models, what we mean are mathematical formulas, <laughs> really. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's a way to say, you know, hey, we, we get this much of a storm event, this much water. When, when we get this much of a storm event in uh, Colfax County, we know that this much water is going to make it into the stream, and that's going to cause it to rise this much. You know, and so they have mathematical formulas that calculate all of that. And sometimes they come up with better, more accurate formulas. Oftentimes they come up with better, more accurate formulas. And so it's possible that you can come up with better modeling 
and that would change your floodplain uh, map. And so you might want to have a letter of map change, a letter of map revision. Jack, if I can a person request a LOMAC if they were listed in the floodplain, but in the 2019 floods, their land never flooded, but it does show below the one below the one foot above BFE. Sherry is asking. But that won't, uh, they can, but that won't matter much. Um, just saying, hey, we had a bad rain and it didn't flood here. And I know 2019 was more than just a bad rain. Um, but they have to have engineering data to back up uh, what it is, uh, their, their application. And that engineering data doesn't have to be a whole lot of formulas and stuff. It can just be, hey, I hired a surveyor to come on out and he surveyed my property. And it says that I'm at, uh, 1259 and the base flood elevation right here is 1258 and I've been paying flood insurance all this time but after the 2019 flood when the water didn't make it to my place um, I thought it'd be be worth my while to hire a surveyor it could be that you're below the base flood elevation but that flood indicate indicated that maybe the models weren't right you know that maybe uh, different modeling would be appropriate for your area, in which case uh, you can still apply for a for a low. You probably want a low mar at that you know in that case, and that means hiring an engineer um, and and paying FEMA some some big money. We're going to get into the fees toward the end, but uh, but it is possible, and I've seen small subdivisions apply for a LOMAR and get it. So um, so it might be worth your while, still might be worth your while. It would cost you thousands. And if you're a community and you're hiring an engineering company, it might cost tens of thousands. Um, but, uh, but if you've got the data and the like, you know, yeah, you can, you can apply. But just the fact that it didn't flood when we had a bad flood event isn't going to cut it. It will take engineering data. Got that? Cool. All right. Okay. Super. Okay. So why do we want to apply? Why would we want to apply for a letter of map change? Well, let's skip the first three bullets and get right down to the bottom one. Uh, the reason that you would want to, more or less, is to determine whether the floodplain requirements apply. Uh, if you're trying to get a letter of map amendment, you're saying my house is higher. These I shouldn't need a permit to, to build on an addition to my house or something because all of the ground around my house is higher than the floodwaters. I shouldn't have been included. Or if you're bringing in fill and you, you filled this property up, up higher, you should say, well, I'm not in the floodplain anymore. The floodplain requirements shouldn't apply to me. Um, and the same thing if you're doing a LOMAR for your whole community. You're saying, well, let's do a study so we can find out who exactly really needs to be um, following our regulations and who doesn't. We want accurate maps. Now, the other things here, you know, understand the effects of a proposed development in the floodplain. Yeah, that, that's a good reason um, to reflect the effects of recent development in the floodplain, like we talked about with Waverly and their dam and the like. Uh, to reflect new and better flood data. Yeah, you know, uh, we're going to get into this, but that's what North Platte did. They got better data and they changed their maps to reflect that. Chuck, another question is aerial or drone photography of the 2019 flood event that shows specific areas flooded or not flooded still would need engineering calcs to do backup. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, FEMA's not just going to accept a, a picture of, of where it flooded in 2019. Um, yeah, good question. And, and I kind of agree with, with all of our thoughts. It's like, look, that was a really bad flood. If it didn't flood there, then that probably shouldn't have been uh, included in the map. But that's not the same as engineering data, you know? And that's what FEMA's going to look at. Now, I think that's very, very relevant if you're getting new maps. If FEMA is doing a new map project, or if, uh, or I know that uh, Papio does map projects, FEMA does map projects. If if uh, if you have community meetings and stuff, because there are new maps being developed for your community, you should bring those pictures in and say, "Look, for Pete's sakes, 
this is where the flood water was in 2019. I don't know where you're getting your engineering stuff, but you need to take a second look at it because this is what actually happened when it flooded. And that'll allow the engineers who are making those new maps to take a look at that and say, okay, let's, let's take this into consideration. But FEMA is not just going to change a map uh, because, uh, because you've got a picture of it uh, of a dry area during a flood, you know. Um, again, not that it doesn't make sense. I'm I'm not FEMA, but but their people don't know. They don't know when you took the picture. They don't know whether the flooding was um, much worse, you know, two hours before that picture was taken, or 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 whatever before you flew the drone or or anything like that. Uh, they want engineering data. Okay, well, there are two types of Lomex. There are the ones that change the maps, and there are the ones that don't change the maps. And we're going to talk about uh, the ones that don't change the maps. We're going to talk about them as amendments, but not like this slide here talks about. I'm not going to call them letters of map amendment, because for me, that's a specific thing. But let me show you this slide here. With letters of map change, we can have amendments where there's no change to the maps, just a letter that says, your property or your house or whatever is not in the floodplain. Now those can be LOMAs where it's natural grade or letters of map revision based on fill where you brought in fill and elevated the property. Um, so letters of map revision based on fill. Neither one of those are gonna change the maps. If your community or if a subdiv subdivider or whatever actually goes through and does a bunch of engineering studies to to get better data, to show better data, um, that would be a letter of map revision, and that will actually change the map. There'll be a map change that comes out because of it. We'll be talking about all three of those today. Let's all take a breath because I'm going to try and get you to change your paradigm. You guys are all outstanding floodplain administrators, or you know the... <laughs> <laughs> Bradley, that was a good look. Uh, you're all outstanding floodplain. I include you, Bradley, with that. Uh, you kind of gave me the, what's he talking about? But um, but you're all good floodplain administrators. You all understand that when we're permitting, um, that we're permitting based on the elevation of the lowest floor. And we want that lowest floor to be a foot above base flood elevations. For the next hour, get that out of your mind. We're not talking about permitting here. We're talking about letters of map change and letters of map change are based on the physical attributes of the land, not on the lowest floor of the building. You know, I've had people say, hey, you know, um, this guy built in his lowest floor is two foot above the BFE, so he's not in the floodplain anymore. No, he's still in the floodplain. He's in the floodplain with a house that's bottom floor is two feet above the base flood elevation. But unless he gets a loma or a lomar, he's still in the floodplain until he gets it removed from the floodplain. And, um, and that Lomar or Loma, whatever he gets, isn't gonna be based on how high his floor is. It's gonna be based on how high the dirt is outside of his house. So it's all based on grade. It's based on the attributes of the land. I say grade, but it could also be based on how the water interacts with the land and, and, and the like. Uh, that could that could cause a property to be removed, but it's all based on the land, not on the elevation of the bottom floor. So for the next hour, let's take off our floodplain management hats and forget about the lowest floor elevation and get on. Again, letters of map change are based on physical attributes of the land. All right, so what forms are used to apply for these uh, letters of uh, letters of map change. Well, if it's just a loma on natural grade, uh, you can use an MTEZ or you can use the MT1. You can print those off and mail them in, or you can submit them online also. So you can fill them out digitally and submit them. Anyone can fill out an MTEZ or an MT1. You can fill it out as a floodplain administrator if you want to. Um, a contractor can fill it out. The property owner can fill it out. Um, so, so any of that. If it's a Lomar F, it has to be the MT1. If it's a Lomar, it has to be an MT2. MT2. And again, if you're not sure about what any of these 
these are. We will be going into more detail about them, and I'll be talking about what forms to fill out again at the end of this presentation. So I said that we were going to touch on conditional letters of map revision, and, and here's where I'm going to touch on it. Um, if you want to read this, and I know Michelle's planning on getting you guys the slide bank, so you'll be able to look at it, uh, you know, so, so you can read this. But I want to really talk to you about what a conditional letter of map request is kind of all about. Let's imagine that Walmart wants to go on ahead and build uh, a new super Walmart down in Beatrice. And so, um, so James is working with them. And this Walmart wants to build, um, and, and just the back corner of it's going to be in the floodplain. So what they want to do is they want to bring in some fill and elevate their whole super Walmart. And then after the after everything's all done, they want to go in and apply for a Lomar F and get the whole super Walmart removed from the floodplain because they've elevated it. The thing is, Walmart doesn't want to go ahead and build this whole structure unless they know it's going to get removed when everything's done. So what they're going to do is they're going to submit their entire package and this would be a Lomar F, a letter of map revision based on fill, because you're going to bring in fill. So they're going to submit their whole package with a conditional letter of map revision based on fill, a Clomar F. They're going to submit all of this to FEMA, and they're going to say, if we build this way, when we're done, will you remove it using a Lomar F? And FEMA will give them a thumbs up or a thumbs down, and, um, and they'll be able to move forward or not. The conditional letter of map revision also allows the community uh, that's going to be affected by this change that opportunity to uh, comment and to approve or deny the applicant's um, project. So, so that's also helpful. All right, so let's start right in with talking about amendments, those things that don't change the floodplain, LOMAs and LOMAR Fs. So LOMAs and LOMAR Fs, they can be used for just a building, but they can also be used to remove the entire property. They can be used to just remove a portion of the property. And when you see one of those, they describe that portion in meets and bounds. It's very difficult to read. Uh, I, I train surveyors. And I've talked to them and they say they don't even, you know, they, they'll just plug all that stuff into a computer and um, and get a picture of it, but they can't just read it. Meets and bounds is tough to read and tough to understand unless it's plotted out. Lomas and Lomars are based on the lowest grade, like we talked about, lowest grade of the landscape rather than the lowest floor of the structure. When we're doing a LOMA or a LOMAR F, we could say, hey, this portion of my property, you can see here the property lines for this uh, first picture. Um, you know, this, this portion of my property is higher than the base flood elevation. That's the part that I want to remove. You can see all the different lines. That's going to be meets and bounds. It's going to say, you know, starting at point whatever, and then heading um, south by southeast at so many degrees and then for so many feet, for 120 feet, and then moving north by northeast uh, for 320 feet um, to you know, point and then turning again, so many degrees. So, um, so that's what you're gonna get is a meets and bounds kind of description like that. Or it could be that the surveyor went on out and they found that the lowest point of the entire lot was still higher than the base flood elevation and they'll get the entire piece of property removed, in which case the description on the letter of map revision or letter of map amendment is just going to say lot 29, you know, or, or the street address or whatever. It could be that they just want the structure removed, just the house. You can see in this picture here, um, let's see, uh, Jeff, can you give me a nod up and down? Can you see my cursor on the screen? Okay, super. So you can see right here, here's the base flood elevation going right across here. So if they had this thing surveyed by a, by a land surveyor, they could, they could get this property where the bush is removed. They could get this property where the tree is removed, whatever. 
but that's going to cost them some money with the surveyor because they're going to, have to take shots all over this property to find out what's higher and what's not higher. And all they care about is their house. So instead, they're going to say, I just want my structure removed. The surveyor is going to take shots all around the corners of the house and, uh, and any place in between that looks like it's low ground. And they're going to just determine what the lowest adjacent grade is. And if they can show that that lowest adjacent grade is still higher than the base flood elevation, that means that the house shouldn't have been in the floodplain. And so they'll get it removed. It's much cheaper um, with the surveyor. All right, so those are all of those amendments. Letters of map revision, letters of map revision based on fill. Let's just now talk about letters of map amendment. Letters of map amendment, the big thing that I want you to get out of this slide is what's in red right there. It's based on the natural ground elevation. Now this, we've kind of gone back and forth on this. Don, you can get, you can, uh, I think you've been a part of this and maybe Marty too, <laughs> who knows, lots of you. but. The question has come up, um, what do we dis establish as natural ground or natural grade? Uh, if there was fill brought in before the map became effective, is that natural or is that fill? And the word that we've got now is that as long as it was brought in before the map became effective, then it's considered natural grade. So, so again, you know, that makes sense if somebody brought in several trucks of dirt back in the 40s, uh, by the time you guys got your maps, uh, that's a part of natural grade now. And they've, they've told us that yes, as long as it's brought in before the map becomes effective, uh, natural grade. So how would you apply for a letter of map amendment? Well, a licensed surveyor of engineer can apply quickly using uh, an ELOMA program. And I know I haven't talked to you about that yet, but we will, but anybody can apply for a LOMA using the MTEZ or even the MT1 form. So what's needed? Well, you have to have certified information, uh, certified elevation information, and that's gonna have to be done by a surveyor or an engineer or an architect, a uh, certified professional or, or a licensed professional. You're gonna have to have maybe the lowest uh, lot elevation, if you're looking at removing a lot, you're just looking at removing a house, you're going to have to have the lowest adjacent grade. Um, you're going to have to have the lowest adjacent grade. Um, the accuracy has to be to the 10th of a foot. And you're going to have to have base flood elevation information. What else is needed? Well, you're gonna to have to have a firmat. Now I say you're gonna to have to have a firmat and I just want you to believe me on that. FEMA might say, well, no, you don't have to have a firmat. You can have some other kind of map or we'll accept something else. But in talking to surveyors, FEMA might say that, but, you, it, but they don't accept it. Uh, they get rejected. So make sure uh, that if you're talking to a surveyor, they're having trouble getting something uh, accepted, some letter of map change accepted, make sure they've included a firm mat along with their, with their package. Um, on that firm mat, and here's an example of a firm mat on this picture, they can just put, you know, they can write on it with a pencil or a pen, put an X or put in a square or something showing where uh, this structure uh, is, is located, where this property is located, whatever. Uh, a Nebraska base flood elevation determination would be required if this is in an A zone. Uh, so you'll have to get one of those. And most of you have applied for those before, or, you know, uh, requested base flood elevation. So you know what those are. We'll be talking about them anyway. So, um, so if you don't, don't worry, we'll, we'll be covering that. So I've gone into a lot of, uh, a big spiel about how important a firm mat is. Um, and so how do we make a firm mat? Well, I've got several slides here that go over how to do it. But at this point, I am going to go on ahead and just go through how to do it um, and show you firsthand how that happens. Now, Michelle or somebody, did I just 
move a Google screen in front of uh, our slide? I did. The hot dog, that makes it much easier. Okay, and Michelle, unmute yourself at some point if, if, I am, if I'm talking about something that's not showing up on the screen. Okay, so the first thing I wanna do in order to make a ferment is go to the MAP, to FEMA's MAP Service Center. Um, and that's msc dot uh, something dot something. As you can see up here, I have it's the MSC the as a quick link. So what I always recommend is just type in MSC and then FEMA and it'll just pop up right here. So msc.fema.gov, it's right there. Bing, we go to it. So, uh, and you've got a link. Did you say, Michelle, did you say? Oh, you're good. Okay, so um, let's imagine, and, sh and, and Sherry, I think you can imagine this real well. Uh, let's imagine that um, in Danabrog, that the Danish bakery is having so much business on Thursdays selling those marvelous pizzas that, um, that they say, hey, we're making some good money, but we're still paying flood insurance. Um, we think that our bakery is built on ground that's higher than the base flood elevation. And Sherry can nod her head saying, no, they were way underwater. But let's just imagine that for a second that, uh, that they wanna get removed. Okay, so what I can do is I can just go ahead and plug in their address, that's 114 Mill Street. Oh. South, I believe. You typed 113. Did I? I bet it'll still get me there, but that's all right. I'll Probably. <laughs> yeah, 14. Mill Street South, Danabrog, D-A-N-N-E-B-R-O-G. And there we go. And we will search. And when we do, there's Dan Abroad right there. Going to give it a little bit of time. See, it's still spinning up there. I hope you still see it spinning. Ah, there we go. So all of this stuff opened up. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to click on this thing that says dynamic map. And uh, it's going to spin for a little while. It might even tell us that we're going to have to wait for a bit. Uh, there you go. It might take a little bit of time. So, um, so while we're doing this, if anyone wants to unmute themselves and tell me what their favorite pizza in Danabrog is, uh, I'd be anxious to hear about that. If not, we have a question check. Okay. Uh, we can <laughs> um, actually let, do business. Okay, I'm yeah. like, let, let me interrupt that. <laughs> Hastings has someone who wants to fill the northeast corner of a lot. This portion is in the 100-year floodplain with a regulated, regulated floodway off of the lot. This portion is also in the dam breach inundation zone. We would like to or we plan to educate about dam safety, obtain an additional easement for the downstream slope of the earthen embankment. We have no overlay district to prevent development in the dam breach inundation zone, which follows the footprint of the 100 year flood. Would you proceed in this case with a Lomar F or with a Clomar F first? Oh. And that's in chat, if that was a lot, if you need to read it again. Yeah, yeah, that is a lot. Um, right offhand, I would say the Clomar F is how I would recommend, um, you know, put it on FEMA's shoulders to figure that one out, you know? Um, and, uh, but the thing is, is, you know, with, with Hastings, um, who do we have to ask this? Yeah, Tara. Yeah, you know, I was going to say Hastings, they've got, you know, they've got Tara there. You know, she's good. Um, so I would say, um, you know, Tara, you've got the knowledge to, to, to look at that and see whether it's even something you want to have happen. Um, Hastings has someone who wants to fill the northeast corner of a lot. The portion is in the 100-year floodplain with a regulatory floodway off the lot. Now, you can't put any fill in the floodway. So if there's going to be fill in the flood way, you know, that's that's a deal breaker right there. Okay. Uh, the portion is also in the dam breach inundation zone 
And, and I don't know about that. That's, that's beyond my expertise. Uh, we plan to educate about dam safety. I think that's good. Uh, educational, additional easement of the downstream slope. We have no overlay district to prevent development in the dam breach inundation zone, but it does follow the flood, the footprint of the hundred year flood. So you do have something that would prevent building there or at least modify that. Uh, so you've got that. Um, again, no fill in the flood way, but uh, I do think it, uh, this, this might be involved enough that you would want them to get a Clomar first. Okay, as you can see on the screen, we got a firm at, and it was just that easy. And that's because Danabrog has digital maps. Um, who do we have from Scott's Bluff? You wanna type up for me? Unmute yourself, no? Okay, well, anyway, let's say that Scott's Bluff um, also says, hey, you know, we have a bakery, Bluff's Bakery, and they're looking at relocating um, down where, um, they're looking at relocating um, down at uh, the State Farm Insurance Agent's place uh, down there just south in, on South Broadway. So they want to do that too. And so uh, they're looking at getting a Loma or a, uh, to try and remove that property from the floodplain. So let me go back. Bing. Okay. So in this case, I'm just going to put Scott's Bluff in here. So I don't have the actual address. And we're going to go there. So here's Scott's Bluff. And as you see, when this, when this one happened, I don't have that dynamic image anymore. And that's because Scott's Bluff has these old paper maps. I better hurry things up, huh? So, yeah. So here is uh, Scott's Bluff's old paper map. Now, what I would have done is I would have gone to show all uh, all um, show all products on this other page. Where was I at? There. Okay, so I would have gone show all products for this area. I would have picked the correct firm, which uh, their, their place is down here. So I can click on this on the map and it'll tell me that it's uh, 005A is where this firm is. So I pull up 005A and here's what I get, you know, and it's, they have just really poor maps. Of course, Scott's Bluff is getting new ones. So that's great. Um, Oops, wrong direction. Okay, so anyway, I know that it's up in this area somewhere. So I'm gonna create a firm at, you see that? I click on that. And the first thing is, what size paper do I want? Well, I typically want eight and a half by 11, but I can change it if I want to. Next thing is select the print area. And in this case, I know that it's right around this S curve right here. So I can just put that square over the whole thing and I'm good. Now, the next thing is I can, I can work, do the same thing with the scale and the north arrow. And in this particular case, I see that's not where I want it to be. So I can click on that. It turns this little box green and I can center that north arrow. I wouldn't have had to if it was something I liked already. The title block, I can do the same thing with the title block, but the title block looks fine to me. And so then I click on preview firm at and it will make a firm at for me. And there it is. Now you look at this firm at and you can see there's not a whole lot of detail in it. And so I would go on ahead and I would supplement this with a printout of the base flood elevation that you would get from DNR. But I wouldn't have our, our our um, BFE determination take the place of this. I would give them both because FEMA puts a lot of, of power in, in this thing. This is their, their legal document. Our base flood elevation 
would give you the information about what the base flood is, better information. It would give you a nice aerial and everything, but uh, actually showing the building and, and the like. But FEMA wants to see this. So I would go ahead and click download and I'd have it and I would send this and our BFE determination to them. Okay, enough said there. Let's, I'm running out of time and I don't wanna keep you guys late. So let's move this out of the way. So here we go, how to make a firm mat. Uh, this is where I tell you how to just go ahead and click that dynamic box if you've got it and it'll make the firm mat for you. Um, if not, if a dynamic map option is not provided, here are the instructions that you would need to go on ahead and make a firm mat if you've got old paper maps, okay? And this is a diagram of what we just talked about. So everything's arrowed and pointed and I'll move on. All right, well, let's take a look at this piece of property here. Many of you have called me about a situation like this. Uh, this is this guy's house right here. And then all of a sudden the bank calls him and says, hey, you have to buy flood insurance because we determined that your property is in the floodplain. Well, yeah, he's got a little bit of property in the floodplain back here, but his house isn't. So what can he do? Well, he can apply for a LOMA OAS, a letter of map amendment out as shown. Now, what this does is it's, you only wanna use a LOMA OAS if it's clearly apparent that this structure, I say property here, but the, the property or structure, whatever it is you're trying to get removed is clearly not in the special flood hazard area. Um, if, if that's the case, this is an option. It doesn't remove anything. It just is clearly a letter. It's a, it's a letter from FEMA that just says it's not in. This structure is not in, or this piece of property is not in. It's shown to be outside of the special flood as an area. There's no elevation data that's needed for this. Uh, documents that are needed are the MT1EZ. You could use, or the MTEZ. You could also use an MT1 if you wanted to. Uh, deed, a firm mat, or a map. I don't know about the ELOMA. Talk to a surveyor. Again, you have to be a registered surveyor in order to use that. Um, so, in review. As with all LOMICs, it's based on, a LOMA is based on the grade of the structure, or a grade, not the structure. LOMAs remove property where the original grade is higher than the BFE. And if all you need is a letter from FEMA saying this house is not in the floodplain, you can look at the floodplain and see that it's out. That's a LOMA OAS, and you can get that too. So here about ELOMAs. In addition to the forms that we talked about, a licensed professional, a surveyor, architect, whatever, can become a registered ELOMA user. So just because they're a surveyor doesn't necessarily mean they can do the ELOMA thing. They have to register. Um, ELOMA platform is only for LOMAs. Uh, the turnaround is very quick. I've heard of people getting LOMAs the same day. Now, I've heard of that. Typically though, I've heard a lot of people say they get them next day or next working day. Um, I think it's like one out of every 10,000, they do like a bigger review on. So it could, you know, there's no promises being made. It could be that they might take a couple of weeks or 30 days if they just happen to draw the short straw when they apply for it. But most of them that I, that I hear about, they, they get them the next day. Uh, they can only be done by a licensed professional or a certified professional. Lomar Fs. Oh, I'm on the last like five minutes. Lomar Fs, letter of map revision based on fill. So this is kind of the same thing, only now they brought fill in and it's important for me to let you know that you have to permit that fill to be brought in. This whole Loma process doesn't get you out of the permitting process. Before they bring that fill in, they have to have your permit, uh, a permit from you to do it. Um, with the Lomar F, keep in mind that the Lomar F does not take the place of permitting, permits needed. Uh, to obtain a, Lo a Lomar F, they have to have your signature. They can't get a Lomar F without your permission. Um, and that, and before you give them your permission, if you're gonna take notes on anything, write this one down. Make sure that you get a site plan clearly showing what is going to be removed from the floodplain. Get it now. 
while they need your signature because getting it later is going to be like pulling teeth. So make sure that they give you the, the entire package before you sign off on it. That's also going to protect you because it could be that they submit a different package than what you signed off on. Once they got your signature, they're going to put the package together and submit it. So, um, so make sure that you have that. The community acknowledgement form is where you're going to is is that signature. Since you take ownership of the floodplain, you're not going to allow this unless you sign off on it. Um, the it the community acknowledgement form says the community is aware, aware that Phil's been placed in the special flood hazard area that you permitted that and that you didn't allow any field to go in the floodway. This is what that community acknowledgement form looks like. We're going to talk about the statement. I'm not going to talk to you much about the signature, but these are the two parts that I think I really want to highlight here is that there's a statement and you're going to sign off on it. So I've broken the statement down into three sections and I'm going to read this slide. I'm sorry about that, but I am going to do that. Um, as a community official responsible for floodplain management, I hereby acknowledge that we have received and reviewed this letter of map revision based on fill or a conditional letter of map revision request. Based on the community's review, we find the completed and proposed project meets or is designed to meet all of the community floodplain management requirements, including the requirement that no fill be placed in the regulatory floodway and that all necessary state, federal, and local permits have been, or in the case of a conditional loan, will be obtained. Okay, so you're saying that it, that it meets your, your, your uh, permitting, pro, your, your uh, ordinance. And I've had several people say, well, look, you know, if it's a Loma, if it's an inch higher than the base flood elevation, they can get it removed. Can they do that with Phil? Well, no, because you're signing off on this saying that it meets your requirements. You're gonna require them to be a foot higher than the base flood elevation before you sign off on this. Uh, you wanna make sure that it meets everything. And that's, that's only one of the requirements of your, of your ordinance. You wanna make sure that it meets, that their project meets your uh, community's floodplain management requirements before you sign it. Part two, the conditional request, the applicant has or will document Endangered Species Act compliance to FEMA to, in, uh, to the issuance of a conditional letter map revision determination. So if it's conditional, FEMA is gonna make them comply with ESA. For Loma F requests, not Clomars, but uh, Clomar Fs, but Loma requests, I acknowledge that compliance with section nine and 10 of the Endangered Species Act has been achieved independently of FEMA's process. Section nine of ESC, ESA prohibits anyone from taking or harming endangered species. If an action might harm an endangered species, a permit is required from the US Fish and Wildlife Service or the National Marine Fishery Service under section 10 of the Endangered Species Act. For actions authorized, funded, or being carried out by federal or state agencies, documentation from an agency showing its compliance with section seven of the Endangered Species Act will be submitted. So again, for, for most of that, if it's not funded federally, if this is not a CLOMA, uh, CLOMAR um, F, then they're, they're, asking, they're asking you to go ahead and verify that, that this meets the Endangered Species Act. Uh, it looks like I'm gonna go over, sorry about that, but I am gonna try and go over it quickly. So uh, the thing is, I'm not gonna have time to, uh, well, I, it's not a part of my slides anyway, but I wouldn't have had time to go over how to do this within the state, but it's very easy. We will have ESA kind of training. Game and Parks has a really good program where all you do is, is look at a map, draw a little rectangle around a piece of property that, that you're wondering about, hit send, and they send you a, a document that says in this particular area, you might, you might have uh, long-nosed bats. And in that, if that's the case, then don't remove any trees during the months of April and May, stuff like that. So nothing I've ever seen in these says, hey, you can't do anything, but it tells you how you need to manage the, uh, the contractor. You know, what can be done, when, and, and how it needs to be looked at. It's a very easy program to, to work. If, if Game and Parks is doing training, uh, I highly recommend that you, uh, you take part in that. If not, we'll try and put something together for you also. Or give me a call. 
whatever, and we'll go over it. Anyway, it's up to you to have documentation that, that you've followed these sections of the Endangered Species Act. And this is the big one. Well, I guess that one's a big one too. Uh, in addition, we have determined that the land and any existing proposed struck any existing or proposed structures to be removed from the special flood hazard area will be reasonably safe from flooding as defined in 44 CFR 65.2, and that we have available upon request all analysis and documentation used to make this determination. For Lomar F request, we understand that this request is being forwarded to FEMA for a possible map revision. Okay, so how do you know whether it's reasonably safe from flooding? Well, one, you can go ahead and require that they follow technical bullet number 10. And in technical bullet number 10 in the back, and technical bullet number 10 is just simply titled How to Build Reasonably Safe from Flooding. And it's not that difficult uh, a bulletin. It's not all that technical to read. We have it on our website. Uh, Michelle, I don't think I gave you a link for that. Do we have one um, that we can put out there for them? Uh, technical bullet number 10. Thanks. I'll grab it. Um, yeah. One other thing, I hope Val is still on. Uh, is Val on? If so, unmute yourself, Val. I am here. Nice. Uh, Val was nice enough to, to, to share this. Um, they have a really good program up in Norfolk where when they sign one of these community acknowledgement forms, they're having them, they're having them sign a building restriction agreement to ensure that structures are reasonably safe from flooding. Now there's a whole lot of whereases and stuff uh, that, that are really good, but, uh, but then there's this one paragraph. At the end, there are three paragraphs that the, that the uh, people signing it need to, need to read and be familiar with. And, and this one here says, previously designated floodplain areas that have been removed from FEMA's effective regulatory floodplain by a letter of map revision based on fill shall have all activities be governed by uh, the floodplain management ordinance of Norfolk Municipal Code. A floodplain development permit shall be issued, an elevation certificate received for all development as defined by the floodplain management ordinance, ordinance in these areas. Um, Val, uh, this is good, and this isn't the final one. The final one has even some more stuff in this paragraph, but Val, we appreciate that. Is this something that you're willing to share uh, to anybody who's on this? Yeah, I mean, if people would like to use this, we actually based it initially off of the Lincoln BRA, but that was seemed very complicated, and so we simplified it. And so essentially, the the whereas as you were talking about is pretty much why we're doing this, what FEMA says right now for floodplain, and then literally we have like three little therefores. And this is the main one and it runs with the land. So it's very simple for people to understand that we want to protect them and we want to protect our floodplain uh, right. program too. A very good document. So, um, so Val Grimes is Norfolk floodplain administrator and, uh, and Val, if they contact me, um, do you mind me sharing the, the ones that you sent me? Nope, that's fine. So you can contact her, you can contact me. And, uh, and I'll provide you those if you want to use those as a template with your own uh, legal people. But the bottom line is, is they can't do a loam RF without your permission. Okay, so what are the outcomes? Well, like we said before, you could either have the property removed, the structure removed, portion of the property removed. But one of the outcomes is, is it could not be removed. So if somebody comes on in and says, hey, I want to build this garage here, I have a Loma, make sure and look at it. Up here in the top corner, um, you'll see it says Loma-DEN. That means it was a Loma that was denied. Everything looks right, except for this thing here, which says non-removal in big bold letters. But uh, but it is possible they've got this document from FEMA, but it was a document saying that their Loma was denied. So that's another outcome. It's a possible outcome. There's a map revision. Letters of map revision are, are, are pretty much something you're going to hire out to an engineering company if, uh, if you're Hastings or, or uh, Columbus or something or, or uh, Beatrice. And you've got your own engineering people there. You might be able to do this in-house. Um, letter of map revision actually will change the maps because you're using uh, better data. 
a LOMAR is a physical update or a refinement of, a, of the information. It could just simply adjust the elevation of the base flood, elevate, uh, uh, the base flood, uh, or it could, could change the, uh, the boundaries of the base flood. Quite frankly, I think if it's changing the elevation, the boundaries are gonna change. So more than likely, it's gonna be both. It requires engineering analysis and scientific data. So again, we had questions early on about, um, about you know, a picture from the flood, you know, and it, it's requi it requires engineering analysis. Uh, they're needed, LOMAs are needed to incorporate post-firm changes, man-made or natural, into the current effective firms. So many of you who are way up in the Northeast, you know, the Elkhorn River just isn't where was before. So, you know, you might need, I, I know they're remapping that already, but if we weren't, that would be something where you would want to request a LOMAR because the river changed, you know, is a natural change. Uh, the river changed place. Uh, in other cases, maybe there were some man-made changes, uh, like we talked about with the, with the dams in Waverly or um, in Wahoo. North Platte is my best example of this. Uh, most of you have driven I-80 going out west, and you've looked to the south side of the, of the interstate as you're driving through North Platte, and you see all of this low ground there. That was all in the floodplain, um, but they were old, old maps. North Platte used better, um, better modeling, and they got about 80% of this area south of the interstate removed from the floodplain, which really helped them with economic growth, as you can see. So one of the things we promised was the LOMA review process. And um, typically the first few requests, um, when, you, when you put it on in, they typically just look it on over and see whether you're missing documents or not. And if you are, then they're gonna kick it back to you and say, hey, we're missing this, this, and this. They're not even gonna read what you submitted. Um, after you fix that, then they're gonna sit down and they're gonna start actually dealing with the content of your submittal. The applicant has 90 days to respond and get them that information that they requested. Um, if they don't, then it, they could drop your request and you'll have to resubmit all over again. LOMA requests are typically processed in about 60 days. Uh, LOMARs in about 90 days. Common problems uh, when they're submitted, uh, incomplete submissions, missing forms, um, or they're signed by the wrong party or the wrong person. Maybe the property owner signed off on the elevation. They don't know that. They're not a surveyor. Um, they might not have paid the right amount of money. Uh, these Most of these cost money. So, uh, or they might uh, omit a grading plan. It's not specific to the request, but it's required for some of the some removals, um, or the lowest adjacent grade isn't given. Um, maybe the status isn't clear. Is this uh, as built or is this uh, a proposed structure that we're looking at? Um, certification that the lowest adjacent grade elevations are based on the same vertical datum. Um, you know, we've got different vertical datums here in Nebraska. Uh, there's, uh, there's stuff, there's survey datum that was Elevation datum from I think 1929 and datum from 1988. And now I think we've got like 2020 datum that's based on maybe it's 2022. I don't, I don't know, but uh, there's new datum coming on out that's based on uh, satellites rather than disks in the ground. So you want to make sure that the datum that you're, you're providing for elevation matches the datum that's on the documents that you provide. Status. When you get back a uh, status, uh, your status on this, uh, they'll either say that it was received uh, and the checking for completeness, that's when they're gonna kick back and say you're missing a form. It's under review, that means they've got all the forms, the correct forms, now they're actually reading it. Uh, they're awaiting the fee, <laughs> that pretty much means, or, or awaiting the data. Um, and then there are different letters sent and you can read this on your own time and see what each of those, each of those mean or it's been dropped. They didn't get the information from you that they needed. And so it's kicked back to you. Here are those fees. And we won't take the time because I've already gone over, going over those. But if you request this from, from uh, Michelle, she'll provide this. This will be in the slide bank. Uh, you can see that it's, that if they're just applying for a Loma, it's free. Um, but if they're looking, if they brought in Phil uh, and they've changed the map, 
then we're talking about 600 or 500, depending on whether they do it online or not. Um, if it's a uh, if it's for multiple structures, then 800 or uh, 700, 800 bucks. And Lomar fees, as you can see, we've really jumped up now. Now we're talking about changing the maps and the costs have really jumped up into the thousands now. Um, but again, if you're looking, if you're a, a you know, if you're Kelly Jack and you're looking at um, a lot of economic development for a major city, 8,000 bucks is kind of one of those drop in the bucket kind of things. If you have the chance to really make some changes and cause some economic growth because of it. Final notes, there we go, <laughs> about time. All approved Lomas, Lomars and Lomar Fs remain valid until the pertinent map is revised. And when that happens, there'll be a SOMA, um, a uh, summary of map actions. And that SOMA is gonna say, which ones are still good? Uh, which of these Lomas or Lomar Fs are still valid? Uh, if they're not valid, they can go ahead and they can still reapply. Uh, it might just be, it, they might still be able to get a, a letter of map revision based on fill, but maybe the elevations just changed a little bit and the one that they have isn't any good, you know, and they need to resubmit. Uh, Lomars should be incorporated in the new maps unless they found new data that says that they're no good anymore. Obvious. Uh, even though they are the community's maps, only FEMA can change them. <laughs> so even though you're, they're your maps, you don't have the authority to change your maps. And remember, an elevation certificate, elevation certificates do not change the maps. So just because someone has an elevation certificate saying that uh, they're higher than the base flood elevation, they haven't been removed from the base flood elevation. They are in the base flood elevation and they comply with your ordinance. And that's pretty much it. If you have any questions like, Chuck, why did you talk so long? Um, you can go ahead and submit that to me chuck.chase at nebraska.gov. Remember, it's an oxymoron. Chuck means to throw something away. Chase means to run after it um, at nebraska.gov. And there's my telephone number. Feel free to call me unless I'm doing a presentation like this. There's my contact information, Elijah's contact information, Adele and Michelle's contact information. There's some way cool things, some website links.